Welcome to the College Football Survivor Show, where playoff survival is always on the line. Here's Shahan J. Haraja and Bobek Hayeri. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the College Football Survivor Show. I'm Bob Akhairi with my co-host, Jahan Jayaraja, national college football writer for CBS Sports. We love college football. We do. During the season, we look at the race for the college football playoff champion, and in the offseason, we broaden to some of the bigger issues in the sport. The United States Congress hosted a roundtable organized by Senator Ted Cruz of Texas that was announced as aiming to codify NIL regulations in college football, though In effect, it was mostly Nick Saban, Alabama Athletic Director Greg Byrne, and ACC Commissioner and friends trying to make their opportunities to try and prevent student-athletes from becoming student-athlete employees. There's a lot to unpack, and we have paid attention to that, as well as a parallel meeting that was taking place in Congress. So we're going to hopefully have a nice, intelligent discussion of those issues. You can always find us on X and TikTok at CFB Survivor Show, where we have video highlights of the show run polls, and listen to your feedback. Please take a moment, if you can, to like, rate, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. But let's get to this roundtable, because, you know, you spin me right round, baby, right round, like a congressional hearing, right round, round, round. But um, <laughs> here I say intelligent discussion and jump into that. But Yeah, that, that's how you're starting the intelligent discussion <laughs> about uh, panels like on Capitol Hill? I like to Capitol defy Hill? expectations. But <laughs> seriously, though, I mean, I, you have to create some levity only because this, I mean, not to say this was like dark conversations, but this got to be some heady stuff. And I know both of us had opportunities to to focus on these. Um, but I'd love to just lead off with you, Shahan. What were your thoughts, you know, after you heard it? Because I know you focused particularly on this roundtable, which I think stole the show because the star power was tremendous. No, that's the thing, right? This is one of the first times that we've seen a not coaching Nick Saban be able to go and talk publicly. And I think it's fair to say that it went interestingly. Uh, I do think overall, he made some very reasonable points, uh, especially from the perspective of somebody who coached for 50 years in college football, right? Uh, He made a case that historically college athletics has been about development of players and people right that that is a core tenet of college athletics and i think that he makes a very reasonable point right like historically you're talking about people coming in being in a program for four or five years graduating with a degree there's an understanding that probably only about two percent of your players are going to have any sort of future playing at the next level and honestly with football especially it's it's really really tenuous to actually make money at that next level And he's seen a shift over the last, you know, 10 years, but especially the last five years to where there really isn't as much focus on uh, sort of what you can do for me long term. There's a very short term look at, well, how much are you going to pay me? That's the only consideration that we're taking into account. And look, I, I think that a lot of people very correctly noted Nick Saban was the highest paid coach in college football for a very, very long time. And so the words sound a little hollow coming from his mouth. But I do also think that there is a reasonable point there as well, where, you know, people are moving so much, where people are, uh, you know, picking programs for all sorts of different reasons. And I've, I've made the case for a long time. I think that this is Uh, sort of the feeding frenzy at the beginning as the rules change, that there's going to be all these people kind of making these short-term decisions because we don't have an example of the long-term decision as yet. But I think ultimately, you know, look, I I think the idea of it being one or the other, either about personal and player development or about money, I I mean, I don't think you can separate these things anymore. Uh, and, And I think that Nick Saban at times tried to. My my issue with a lot of the approach that I've been hearing, and I have such a deep respect for Nick Saban, and even some of his earlier comments I just want to, to initially note, is that I remember there was that Chris Lowe article um, that came out where he was talking about, you know, like suddenly 78% of the kids only want to talk about the bag. But he also kind of, he also tempered that. He said, you know, I'm not saying it's wrong, it's just different. And that's him saying it for the record. Um, so I think he's just noticing a shift in how coaching is working. And uh, and I'm just going to predicate that. However, I, I found some of the comments and some of the opinions in that regard a little disingenuous because it it 
it ignores the fact that players weren't allowed to ask for money before. I mean, openly, openly, you know, you couldn't, you know, I always think of the classic movie Blue Chips, but uh, you, know, you couldn't ask for the tractor. Now you can actually, yo, I'd love to get a tractor for my mom or my dad or whatever, um, you know, or a, <laughs> clearly a Lamborghini. Uh, if I'd like to play for you, you can actually ask for that. And then whatever fake job you do in NIL will, will cover it. But I think the, the idea that suddenly the kids want it now, it's like if you go and ask players 10 years ago, if you go and ask players 20 years ago, 30 years ago, would you have liked to have asked for money? A lot of them would have said yes. I mean, as all of this pay the players, compensate the players has evolved over time, we've always heard them say that. I mean, I could think of players from all of those the last several decades who were trying to be advocates and were usually being shouted down because for whatever reason, the winds of change um, took a while to set sail. And now... You know, public opinion has shifted quite a bit where the idea of compensating them has become tenable. It's just that some, I think, folks didn't realize how much money was going to be on the table for them. So, and I agree with you. I think you can't separate the two now. You can have player development and player compensation at the same time. Now, whether every university can support that is a, is a separate question. But one thing that we can note about the roundtable is they certainly only sampled from the, the tip t- tippy top. That was also part of a little bit of the issue. I mean, it brought a lot of attention that that roundtable was packed. Like when you see pictures of that hall, it was standing room only. You, know, you brought, again, as we said, you brought in Nick Saban, you brought in Greg Byrne, the athletic director who just, you know, obviously on good terms with Nick Saban, um, the ACC commissioner, Jim Phillips, you had the Cavender twins. Um, you had the head of the uh, collective uh, association, their president, I guess, of their trade organization. You had an NIL attorney, and then you had some other Congress people that came in, also given you know their their hits. I almost imagine it like like a, a Wu Tang video, like a Wu Tang track, where they're like handing the mic off, and like one of them also kind of. Go- <laughs> one of the funny things is, uh, so again, this was organized by Ted Cruz, and Ted Cruz very notably sat on the side of the quote unquote witnesses. Like he was sitting next to Nick Saban. He did not sit with the other senators. Now Ted Cruz had no role being on that side. He just wanted to be in the photographs sitting next to Nick Saban, which I also notably, he did not sit next to the NIL attorney or he didn't sit next to the, the, uh, the collective association head. He very much wanted to be photographed sitting next to Nick Saban at this round table. I think one other thing that's interesting is that Nick Saban, it felt like also proposed a lot of uh, problems that I don't think he necessarily understood the implications of some of the solutions he's talking about. Because one of the things he talked about was there's this uh, sort of differing level of support and where collectives that can raise the most money are going to have a huge advantage over others. My response to him would be, you coached at the University of Alabama. You decided to leave coaching at Toledo to go to Michigan State. You understood, even at the time, what resources could mean for a coaching staff. So there's no secret that some programs have more money than others. Now, he also talked about the idea of revenue sharing more directly from the perspective of Uh, revenue sharing with players, but there did seem to be some undercurrent of revenue sharing television contracts, maybe with other universities as well. Uh, You know, one thing that he said is that we really want to have sort of a balanced situation legally where the laws are similar in every state instead of Florida and Texas and California and Ohio all having different laws. And I think that that is something that uh, that really does make a lot of sense. Right? I, I think that having these piecemeal structures is a really negative thing overall. But again, it, it starts getting into the implication of what you're saying. One of the things that we talk about all the time with the NFL versus college football is if you are a fan of a bad NFL team, for example, my Chicago Bears, well, guess what? You get the number one draft pick. You have an opportunity to pick better players because there is one an opportunity to draft uh, from college players. And two, there's revenue sharing to where you can build the best franchise in the NFL in Buffalo or Kansas City or Green Bay. That doesn't exist in college football for reasons that have only to do with that 1% at the top, right? There, there's, no, uh, there's no desire from that group to go in and to share their gains. In fact, you know, I, I kind of made this point on social media earlier. If you look at these players and you wonder why are they asking for money, 
look at what their schools have done over the past three years. We're in a situation now where UCLA is about to play conference games in Piscataway, New Jersey, for no reason other than a bag. There's a consolidation right now of money, of resources, of major brands right now in college football towards two conferences. We're heading in a lot of ways, what it seems like, towards the Super League. Right now, even with the playoff structure, we're starting to see uh, the, the big two leagues are trying to leverage their position to squeeze everybody else out and present them with worse and worse situations, whether it's three auto bids for the college football playoff for league, whether it's a much bigger slice of the pie uh, from the playoff revenue. And ultimately, how can you be surprised that players are asking for a piece of that when these schools have been so open about whoring themselves out and asking for it too? Yeah, it's for me, listening to these arguments that were being made yesterday, and, and it was weird to suddenly see Nick's, and again, I think to be to his credit, Coach Saban was there to to advocate. So he wasn't going to be quite like a, the more the Chris Lowe interview I just mentioned. He wasn't going to necessarily give, you know, a more of a nuanced view, which I think most people hold. But when you're being asked to speak to Congress, now it wasn't an official hearing again. It was more, that's I think why Ted Cruz wanted to just sit next to Saban. It's a round table. Oh, yeah. It's not, a, oh, it's yeah. not a, a hearing. We're not actually a fact finder here, but it was interesting because it, it almost felt like several old men yelling at clouds along with the Cavender twins um, who weren't yelling at clouds. They, they, I, I don't want to diss them. I actually, some of their stuff was interesting. I thought they, they made some interesting requests on what would help them. Um, but I think it's, it's this push against the changing world and this sports continue to evolve. I mean, I'm not going to, you know, the hack and I do would be like, oh yeah, like the forward pass, you know, like, no, but the sport has evolved. Nick Saban is actually for all the, the 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 things that have come up with him saying like he was just getting tired of coaching and it changed too much. I mean, yeah, he's 72. I think at this point he's just tired of changing with it. And I don't blame anybody for that. I mean, he, again, no one can diss the man for what he accomplished, you know, up until the very end of when he decided to step away. But he's one of the reasons the sport evolved. He's like the reason the CEO coach is a concept where right? guys like Jimbo Fisher had to finally get told, no, you can't call your plays. You got to hire somebody to call plays for you or, or, you know, Coaches in the traditional sense, that's why you have someone like Chip Kelly finally saying like, all right, I'm done. I just want to call plays. There's going to be, um, and we've talked about this in previous episodes, there's going to be a shift. You're going to get coaches, younger coaches, who are absolutely fine with trying to juggle all of these things. Like the recruiting trail went crazy. I mean, it's so funny, you know, listening to you talk about, uh, obviously, Saban has had previous stops at Toledo and at Michigan State before he obviously went to LSU. Um it was fascinating to think that, you know, when you, especially some of the writing that has come out with him uh, over his career, how much he was into recruiting, how much, like, you would get emotional when he would lose a key recruit. And, you know, I, no diss on that. I think it's fascinating to see that level of passion. But so when he got to be at a place like Alabama, he tuned that entire beast around recruiting players. And that's what he's really good at. That's what he loves to focus on. There's a lot of coaches who hate that. <laughs> you know, if you go back a generation before him, they were like, really? I mean, I, I couldn't just say like, you know, just gather all the recruits. Some of them were good. Some of them were bad. They just want to do the X and O. So the sport continues to evolve. I mean, now suddenly everyone's got a general manager, um, which is just kind of a redressed version of somebody who was already in the staff. But, you know, we're seeing this this kind of broadening of how the sport is going. Um, so listening to some of the complaints hollowed, uh, rang a little hollow when you considered one of the speakers had changed the sport in many ways himself. And then quite frankly, it's frustrating because these complaints won't really change anything. They, you know, I don't expect changes at all. And I'll get to that a little later in this episode. But I mean, the harsh reality is people don't seem to mind the way the sport is evolving. The people who are complaining are not representative of the audience because I know we're in the off season. So we are the hardest core fans are the ones paying attention. The people writing, uh, you know, they, it, there aren't games going on. So we're looking for material to talk about. And some of the writing I hear is a lot of a hand wringing. Oh, woe is me. Usually from older gentlemen um, writing columns about, oh, the, the world is doomed. But then you see, actually, your, col your colleague, uh, Dennis Dodd, pointed out something great. He's like, you know, back to back attendance, years of attendance increases. That's a striking thing. That goes against a trend that had been dragging on for some time. TV ratings are up. The, uh, the casuals, the filthy casuals, however you want to say it, they love the sport. I mean, when you look at the impact someone like Deion Sanders is having right now, people are rushing to see the games that he was coaching, partially because of him, partially because of the product in the field. But overall, again, like the playoff was fascinating. We had four excellent teams. People like to go. Now, 
you know, a great example of this, and I just use a quick counter example, because I sometimes mention Akron. Like if Akron were to drop football, or at least from FBS, probably wouldn't hurt the overall structure of who's watching. Most of the Mac, prob- okay, yeah, maybe Tuesday and Thursday nights, maybe some Wednesday night games might not be seen as much. But I mean, they wouldn't make the impact that that people fear in in this race to kind of uh, increase the uh, the revenue for the top of the teams. I'm, I'm going into all of this just to say that going to a paying model, if we have to start paying the students as employees, is probably going to see a big drop in the number of teams that can participate. I'm not guaranteeing it, but we could. But I don't think it's going to harm the bottom line of the sport. I think we're going to get, if anything, just a concentration on the teams that can compete and perhaps should be competing at the level they are. But that was kind of a bit of a ramble there. But there's just so many things when you watch all of this. I mean, but the thing that just, again, the takeaway to me is that we're seeing like the death throes of the old guard um, combined with some very savvy political maneuvers by the actual heads of these departments. Like the ADs, the conference commissioners, they do know what they're doing. And maybe we can touch on that in a little bit. But a lot of this this hand-wringing, I think, is just quite honestly meaningless. Well, I think ultimately we're kind of trying to find where this medium is, right? Because we are seeing, again, such a consolidation. I I do agree. You know, look, I think that there's an acknowledgement across the sport that there's not 134 teams that are playing the same sports. I think that the question becomes like, where is that line? Are, Are we stopping it at 12 teams are playing the same sport? Are we stopping it at 40 teams? Are we stopping it at 68 teams, right? Like, I think that that's a big part of the conversation and the question right now uh, that I don't know that anybody has real answer to. You know, and again, and it goes back in some ways to the Charlie Baker proposal that we've talked about at length, where, uh, you know, potentially teams can opt in and have a trust based compensation model. Now, I, I do, and, and this tra- uh, this kind of uh, leads also into the the hearing that you watched a little bit more of, which was, uh, you know, I think one of the biggest things at stake right now is trying to figure out. Uh, the the sort of model, right? Whether the employee model is the only way, whether there's a way to do revenue sharing that makes sense, whether it should be kept kind of more third party type stuff. Uh, you know, I, I'll read a quote from Greg Byrne, the Alabama athletic director. Uh, he said, we're looking for some safe havens from an employee status standpoint, from a Title IX standpoint, and just some safe havens from an antitrust standpoint so that we can have the enterprise of college athletics move forward and offer broad opportunities across the board. And I think on its face. This sounds pretty reasonable. But again, when you have a sport that is not acting in the interests of the values that he just said, right, that isn't acting in the best interests of Title IX or antitrust or employee status, uh, like, I think that that's where you start to run into questions and where you start to run into issues of, are you just trying to do this because you've created an unsustainable business model where, you know, Greg Byrne said yesterday, uh, you know, there are a number of sports on Alabama's campus that combine to lose $40 million a year. Well, a case that I've made for a long time is that somehow we have Division Three athletics. <laughs> somehow we have high school athletics. I'm not saying that these are the same things or that they should only be funded to that extent. But I mean, I, th- I think a question is, well, if you're bringing in that much money to your athletic department, a lot of donations also that are not tied necessarily to a single sport, like, I don't know, man, find a model that works for you because there's a lot of reasons, right? I mean, the Ivy Leagues host more sports than any other league and they don't really make money on their sports. They do it because one, it drives donations to their university Two, it it keeps people involved, right? Like there are people at Harvard who love their time on the rowing team and they stay involved with the university because the university has a rowing team. And three, uh, it also helps attract students to your university. And so the idea that you as a university also only look at athletics through the lens of dollars and cents doesn't really make a whole lot of sense because there's a lot of benefits to having uh, an athletic department in the first place. Yeah, one takeaway I think I'd love our listeners to realize is what happened uh, in Congress yesterday at both hearings was the NCAA and its its allies were trying to create a united front to try and push their Hail Mary. And their Hail Mary is congressional action to protect them. Because, for example, Nick, the takeaway from from a lot of the, the folks speaking yesterday, Nick Saban, has, again, he's 
received the most attention was, you know, we're okay with revenue sharing, but we don't want them to be employees. That is impossible to have work unless Congress carves them out that exception, as Byrne had referenced, basically giving them an exception to not become employees. You need that because without Congress changing the laws just for college athletics, the rules of employment, all the employment laws that are out there are going to catch up with college athletics and rule that everyone's going to be an employee. Now, before I get to the next part, I just want to say the guy who organized the round table, Senator Ted Cruz, gave a 50-50 chance of anything happening. And he apparently has said, like, yeah, I'm, I'm receiving from my 60-40 uh, positive opportunity. And I'm going to tell you, a year ago, no one gave this a chance of passing. He is giving the most generous view possible because he literally just called this hearing and, you know, he wanted to have all these, these folks show up and he's trying to please people. I get it. I mean, I'm not that's that's the, the, the way the sausage is made in Washington. No, no, no disregard there. No, no insult to any of that. But, you know, this is almost certainly not going to go anywhere. Uh, and and we'll, I'll get to some of the even details of why it's almost certainly going to go anywhere, probably towards the end of this episode. But. It's it, we are literally watching the Hail Mary attempt by all of the stakeholders that want them to not become employees. Um, I'm going to just shift over to that other hearing. So, again, I love it. The flashy. It's a roundtable, a nice, simple name. We're going to talk about, you know, NIL stuff, but not really NIL stuff. We're really just going to talk about an employee issue. We're going to have all these hot topics. The other hearing was um, a joint subcommittee legislative hearing held by the subcommittees on health, employment, labor, and pensions, as well as a subcommittee on higher education and workforce development. So again, very sexy stuff here, um, both under the House Education and Workforce Committee. They explicitly named it safe, I love it. This I love when the congressional titles give away what they're really hoping to get out of it. Safeguarding student athletes from NLRB misclassification. Like we are trying to keep these students from being accidentally classified as employees. Again, to some extent that the, these titles get determined by whoever, whichever party's in charge and, and wants to create it. But I mean, one of the more interesting, because uh, again, they, they brought up an interesting group of folks. There were uh, some uh, professors. There were a few people from the NCAA. There was a former student athlete who'd become an attorney via some minor law school. But the one that I thought, actually almost everybody on this was an attorney, but the most interesting um, counter arguments uh, to why students should not be ruled as employees to the NLRB, came from the St. Joseph's AD. Um, and I've, she herself is an attorney, but she's also their athletic director. And so again, she gave a lot of the boilerplate arguments that you expect from the NCAA. You know, you know, the, she acknowledges they need to reimagine college athletics. They need to produce, provide additional resources. Um, she, you know, welcome President Baker's recent proposal, you know, to kind of create this separate issue. But what I thought was nice about hearing from her was, first of all, she's not a P4 program. She is an Atlantic 10 program, D1, but they don't have football. They have 480 student athletes, which is approximately 10% of their student body. Um, and again, as she noted, while power five athletic expenses can exceed a hundred million and some are closer to 250 million, her budget's just over $20 million uh, for her entire athletic department. So, and she pointed out the biggest chunk of her athletic department is student financial aid. So hearing from her, you hear someone who's actually kind of coming from the approach of like, this could be an existential crisis for my institution. And I want to say there are programs with football teams that are absolutely in the same boat. So listening to some of her issues that she had with it, she, again, as a wise attorney, started because, again, the NLRB, for those who don't remember, back when Northwestern players back in 2014, they wanted to be employees. The, the lower level NRLB said, yes, you can uh, become a union if you'd like to be. Then the, the national NLRB board voted unanimously to deny that because they said the problem is we interfere with competition. For those who aren't aware the National Labor Relations Board can only uh, take care of public, pardon me, private institutions. Northwestern, as you may know, at least up until this year, was the only private institution. So that suddenly created an unfair balance where the, the student athletes at Northwestern could become a union and all the public school athletes could not. So they said, we're not going to interfere with competition. Therefore, we're not going to allow the Northwestern players to become a union. And there's a whole evolution of where we were then and where we are now, but I'll get to that perhaps later. All of that said, uh, she started to point out the fact that, you know, NLR, she threw out all of the classic arguments. 
the National Labor Relations Act, which is what guides the NLRB, does not have jurisdiction over public institutions. They also had an NL- NLRB, ugh, I love that acronym, NLRB ruling back in 2020 involving a private Christian school, Bethany College. That one said, and again, we haven't seen how it would ever be compared against a institution for student athletes, but in that ruling, the uh, they, the NLRB said it did not have jurisdiction over the faculty of an educational institution if it was holding itself as a public religious institution, is a nonprofit, and is religiously affiliated. That could be a potential problem. I mean, it could be a red herring, but again, I wanted to throw that one out there because there's certainly plenty of private religious institutions that play D1, um, not necessarily all on FBS, but we certainly have Liberty, we have Notre Dame, we have you know a couple out there that should be noted, and maybe some of these schools that have very loose affiliations are going to suddenly dust them off. Suddenly the C in TCU is going to come out. Um, <laughs> uh, and again, I acknowledge Baylor as well. Um, and then the other co- concern is that uh, even if the laws were different, just because the student athletes can unionize doesn't mean that they will. And the concern there is you could end up with an interesting kind of mishmash of players unionizing and not unionizing. And one of my most, one of my favorite arguments she made, just because it was fascinating, she argued Title IX. What if the players on the men's basketball team create a collective bargaining agreement that pays them more than the players on the women's basketball team? How is that going to come into play? We don't know that. So to her credit, she threw up some interesting arguments that you'd love to hear arguments in the other direction. Um, I could keep going on this. I don't want to like completely go because there was an entire argument I want to get to by uh, uh, Mark Gaston Pierce, the visiting professor and executive director of the Workers' Rights Institute at Georgetown. He himself was actually the chairman of the NLRB when they handed down that Northwestern decision. But uh, do you mind just giving me one second? I want to run through that one real quick because it's just he he in succinct manner went over what has changed since Northwestern. And he went through, and I love it, he cited the cases. Because in twenty, basically early 2015, the national level NLRB struck down the lower level and said, no, for the reasons I just mentioned earlier, Northwestern cannot unionize their players. Suddenly, in 2015, a little later in a different industrial relations case, um, the Browning-Ferris Industries decision said the criteria can expand to joint employer status. Now, That did come into play recently. We'll get to that. I want you to remember that joint employer status. You can have arguments on that. 2016, Columbia University, the graduate students there successfully were ruled as employees under the National Labor Relations Act and were able to unionize. That Columbia case was the one where I think a lot of the beachheads are being formed for the other private union institutions and what Dartmouth was able to kind of hang its hat on. In 2017, the chair, uh, the, the next chair of the NLRB issued a memo asserting that scholarship football players at Northwestern and other D1 football players at private universities are employers on un- employees, pardon me, under the NLRA. Jump to 2021. We had the Austin case, the Supreme Court's unanimous decision ruling the NCAA's rules restricting certain education related benefits for college athletes violate federal antitrust laws. Needless to say, everyone knows Kavanaugh's concurrence, which I think that's how everyone should refer it. I don't like the people. Kavanaugh's concurrence is like the perfect shorthand for this. But for those who don't remember, you know, there are serious questions whether the NCAA's remaining compensation rules can pass muster. And when he was talking about ways they could solve the NCAA compensation rule, he said colleges and student athletes could potentially engage in collective bargaining or seek some other negotiated agreement to provide student athletes a fair share of revenues that they generate. So again, collective bargaining, that is a union direction. 2021, the National Labor Relations Board uh, General Counsel issued a memo after that saying that the NCAA athletes would be employees under the National Labor Relations Act. 2022, this is where that argument that I said earlier, that precedent on the joint employer came into play. The USC case, which is currently ongoing, Players are suing USC and saying they're joint employers with not only USC, but also the Pac-12 conference, or whoever they are now, as well as the NCAA. If that comes down, that they are joint employers, that could in and of itself hook in all the other public universities that were previously not involved in NLRB issues. Then finally, we have the Dartmouth case that just came down um, that said the players are allowed to join unions. And again, that is currently being um, being appealed. So when you see that progression and where the law is taking us and where the, uh, especially on the union issue, 
it's easy to see, well, one of two things. It's inevitable that the players are going to be ruled employees or potentially allowed to join unions. But secondly, you absolutely underlines the fact of why the NCAA and its allies are making this push to get Congress to close this door. Because that's what they are. They really are on a moment. One of the, um, one of the again, I didn't get to his uh, testimony, but one of the professor they had from Marquette Law, who is, again, a very respected person, Matthew Mitten, he was arguing on the behalf of not making them employees. And he basically, the way he said it is, this is going to let the cat out of the bag. If we do not stop it now, the cat's going to jump out of the bag. He's basically like, I told you guys this with NIL a few years ago. Remember that one? Yeah, apparently he was anti-NIL. He's like, if we don't regulate this, the cat's going to jump out of the bag. And I 100% agree with that take. So that's where we are. Whether it can happen when an election year, that's a whole other can, kettle of fish. So obviously, you know, you teach law at the University of Minnesota. So from your perspective, I mean, like you said, it, it would take congressional action likely to prevent this from careening into them becoming employees. So as you know, we're outsiders, right? I mean, we cover the sport, but we're not in the sport. Mm -hmm. I mean, what from your perspective is for the enterprise and for the players, the best outcome? Well, for the enterprise, uh, the NCAA and the institutions, they need congressional regulation. They absolutely need Congress to pass some kind of some kind of exception that says you guys cannot become employees. Just the, the government, the, the laws of the land say they can't. And then the courts because again, let, let's, I mean, just to give your know, listeners a really quick heads up on this, if Congress creates it, it basically becomes a law unless it somehow violates the U.S. Constitution, which doubt on that one. You know, like if Congress were to say it probably would not interfere with, with the Constitution, probably not. I mean, there will probably be attempts, but it would be it would be a long shot at best. So that is the best opportunity for the uh, for the institutions and, and the enterprise. For the players, quite possibly, it's just like if Congress doesn't act, it's inevitable. It's coming. I mean, every every year that has passed, it just seems we're getting closer to the fact that they're going to have to be employees. Once, I would say, especially last off season, when when the uh, the the second wind of nil, when we when we got past that initial wave, and then the state started changing their own laws. I mean, it was inevitable that they were loosening the rules to the point that they were going to force. And it's ironic, too, you know, like Tennessee and Virginia, the states literally just got, won that preliminary injunction, which now keeps the NSA from enforcing their rules and allows like a free for all. I mean, I remember I think it was Stuart Mandel who after that came down, said, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the movie Blue Chips, all the things that were wrong in that movie are now totally legal. Um, so we're it's inevitable. They they are all in a race. And I the way I've kind of phrased it in the in a you know last year was they're in a race to the lowest common denominator on the amount of laws that are regulating NIL. And by doing so, they are absolutely creating an employee employee relationship. So, you know, it, it's what if you're a player, just sit back as long as Congress doesn't act. And I don't think it's possible. It should be OK, because the, the, the biggest the, the, the irony in all of this is you look at the parties and they're, they're, both parties seem to want to regulate it in some way. The biggest divide seems to be the, the GOP and the, Repu uh, the Republican Party would like it to be done by the NCAA, which, you know, again, you're going to need to arm them with congressional weapons to do that, right? Um, so again, the, the party of small government wants to have, gov you know, wants to arm this, this, this entity with, with, a, with a restriction on trade and, and to give them an opportunity. And then the Democrats are more leaning towards perhaps a governmental or extra governmental organization, which is fascinating because it brought up the point, and I never thought about this. The U.S. is the only major nation without like a ministry of sport or equivalent thereof. Like every other country, Canada, Japan, you know, Europe, you know, the good, the, the bad guy countries, everyone has a ministry of sport. It's funny too, like Spain has like an entire like court system. For handling, you know, dis I assume soccer disputes, but, you know, s disputes about these things. In the United States are like, no, it's a free for all. And Congress will, you know, <laughs> defend you. I mean, historically, there were exceptions carved well, out, you know, the. Uh, and I, I do think that one thing that's interesting about that is in a lot of ways, especially when you look at uh, the kind of sports, especially that a ministry of sport would be dealing with, is that college athletics has kind of been the thing that's driven that, right? I mean, we don't need, uh, we haven't historically needed a ministry of sport to uh, to to train gymnasts, mm -hmm. right? We haven't needed a ministry of sport to, uh, it, whatever it is, right? We have obviously the US Olympic Committee, but really this has come in so many ways from the infrastructure provided by college athletics. 
You're absolutely right. And one of the things that that kind of, as you think it through, if we get to more of the, I mean, because there's various ways. I mean, while I think we're on the path of seeing players, at least some players regulated or ruled as employees, I should say, if it's separating into the Charlie Baker model, if it's just suddenly there's a ruling and boom, everyone's an employee now, figure it out yourselves, which is kind of how NIL sort of felt. You know, I'm worried about, Again, not necessarily at the the P5 level, at the top you know, universities. They'll come up with ways to keep some of these Olympic sports around. But we're going to see a real crushing development, especially on, you know, starting from midway through the D1 all the way down to D3, especially if D2 and D3 have to start paying athletes. Um, and in that case, maybe it becomes an existential crisis where we do need an entity like a ministry of sport by the government just to support the Olympic, the Olympic sports. Cause, uh, or do we care about it? We'll, we'll literally be asking ourselves, do we care? I, I think we care about it. I, th- I think that the U S cares about whether <laughs> they, uh, they suddenly start falling to seventh or eighth place in the gold medal. Yeah, that's standards. what I think. Are people going to suddenly notice? Is it going to be like a time delay? Like suddenly like 10 years later, like, why are we, you know, why is Laos keep being us in the medal count? You know, like I, I, I just, I'm trying to come up with, you know, like the circumstances where, or, or do our athletes go and train at international universities or, you know, uh, I mean, which would be funny because we see the reverse. Sometimes you see, you know, I love watching the Olympics. Oh, fight. all the time. Yeah. You know, like this, this, this Tunisian swimmer went to USC or something. You're like, oh, oh, cool. You know, and good luck. Good, good first. You got a gold. My university got a gold, you know, um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, there was actually a, there was a, there was a high jumper from Sri Lanka, actually, where my family's from, who actually went to Texas A&M Commerce and was like the best high jumper in division two and posted like a top five mark in the nation. Like people come here because of our robust system. And, you know, I I think another thing just to mention is like these are things worth saving, right? These are things worth having. And, uh, you know, a a point that gets brought up, but that is serious, is that outside of the GI Bill, NCAA athletics are the largest provider of, uh, of free education out of any entity in the country. And that's real. Right. Like, like that is real. That is sincere. Obviously, we get to develop at a high level these these great athletes and all these different other sports. And uh, and I think, like you mentioned, the, the, the conversation gets so focused on just football that I think that we do. I mean, and, and major college football, especially right mm-hmm. when you, when I was covering, uh, you know, Texas A&M Commerce, right, which was in Division two at the time or Mary Harden Baylor, like. I don't think that there's any sort of idea or thought that these are athletes worth millions of dollars, right? Like yeah. they, they are doing it because they they want to play. It's it's more of an extracurricular activity. But I think again, that's why for me, like I, actually, let, let me again ask you: Is there a like an obvious blind spot or a question in the Charlie Baker model? And let's say hypothetically, if the NCAA is able to get some version of that carve out. Well, okay. Well, the carve out would be pretty good. That one would be hard to to fight. I don't know if there would be exceptions to it, at least in terms of being employment. That would allow universities to decide whether or not they want to compensate them at all or not. That would give the D3 people their opportunity or the non-scholarship, athletic scholarship teams to kind of go the way they were going. But I think what would concern me with the Charlie Baker model, and this has been in the back of my head, like, okay, yeah, let's say you create a, a new division where it's just the top, the creme de la creme of the P, uh, the, the P4, or however you want to phrase it, um, how is that going to still protect the other teams? I think they're hoping that it'll create sort of an opportunity like uh, competition. Once you create competition, that helps it. Like, oh, there's a, you can either be in this division or that division, and players will also have the choice whether they want to join, you know, the remainder teams or they want to go and join that 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 compensation model or or you know, the NIA kind of gets forgotten in all of this, but we'll set that aside. But I, I'm I'm worried that may not work because that that will not that w- there will be challenges to it. I guarantee you, there's going to be somebody on I don't care what team it is, maybe someone who's from FB, FCS, like a superstar player at South Dakota State, because I mean we know there are guys there that are going to go to the NFL, you know, versus you know, or even some of the remaining teams. I'm not going to call anyone out, Akron, um, who who might end up not in that in that Charlie Baker model. But um, man, LeBron James better not be listening hey, to this you know, podcast. If he had gone he to is, college, he's come for you. <laughs> oh yeah, he was totally going to be a zip. Yeah, <laughs> totally. <laughs> but you know, here's the thing. I love that you pointed out though, because people. I thought I remember the first time I heard this number, I thought it was a typo. There are in just the NCAA uh, twenty thousand teams, like not athletes. 
teams across all the NCAA divisions. And the total number of athletes is over half a million. Like there's like, and again, if you add, so there's 520,000 NCAA athletes, if you add the NAIA, it's probably like 540, 550,000 student athletes on any given year. So yeah, there's a lot of people who have connections or reasons they're being able to either going to college or having an ability to go to college. Again, clearly not $500,000 scholarship athletes, but still a, a significant portion of them are. All of those opportunities could potentially evaporate if their sports start getting eliminated. Because I'm going to tell you, the football players, I think if you add up all the football players in D1, I think you get like, what, 40,000? Um, or is that all levels? I think it's all levels. Like 20,000 D1. That might be all 40, levels. 40,000, yeah. it's like all levels. It's still a lot of kids. And imagine yeah, like yeah. all of these guys, which also, by the way, uh, kind of hammers the point of how hard it is to get in the NFL. But I mean, but for all of these guys, you know, and all these men and women and all the divisions, I mean, there's, there's, there is a real dire situation if they can't play or have an opportunity to play now again d3 the other shift here too one thing i will note and this is something that came up again um uh from the uh from the, the professor mitten who is again on the uh enterprise side of the uh argument he did say what we may see is a shift to clubs and whether or not they could get clubs to work and i think that may be it if if the universities are forced to pay we may see a shift to and again, I know all of you don't have this off the top of your head, right? But the British university model where all of their college sports are clubs, but it's a very well organized. There is actually a national collegiate um, club football. I forgot national club football association within the United States. So they're like the Ohio state team is actually quite good. The Navy team is quite good. You know, these are guys that, that wear full pads and play real college football. They just, it's a club team. It's not a, uh, through the uh, division of athletics. So we may see a shift to that. and. With all the lawyers and all the administrators, I would not be surprised if they come up with a way of creating a club sport model that just meets the definitions of staying outside of who has to pay. And that may be the next, to be honest, and maybe that's the, what, I, what people don't talk about enough. What would, when they draw that line, here's who's going to be an employee, what do you need to do just to stay outside of it? I mean, just outside of it, not quite that that collegiate, you know, the uh, the, uh, the the club football version I just said. But what do we do just to stay an athletic department that runs? I mean, do we call them intramurals now, brother? You know, or sorry, <laughs> the, the Dan Hawkins thing. But do we uh, wh where do we take it? I mean, that's that is going to be one of the great questions if we're forced to pay everybody. So I think. Like from my perspective, right? So let's say that the Baker proposal goes through. So I, I think that ultimately, if not the entire Power Five, I think the vast majority of the Power Five would opt into it. And if I mean, I think they'd probably be forced in a lot of ways to opt into it, right? So, and then I think you'd have a handful of smaller programs that would try, right? Like maybe you see a Boise State or a Memphis. Liberty or, will you pay know, anything it takes. <laughs> Liberty is definitely... <laughs> And so, I mean, I, I guess from my perspective, right, uh, if that were to happen and you have this sort of upper division that's kind of making its own rules, well, I mean, okay, so like South Dakota State, they've had some great players over the years, right? Uh, Pierre Strong was a running back who was there, who uh, ended up in the NFL. I think he's uh, he was with the Patriots. I can't remember where he is now. Well, like, he limited his brand value by being at South Dakota State when maybe he could like he was good enough to play in the NFL he could have played major college football potentially if he transferred up but obviously you know he decided to stay there because it was great for his development and he won titles and you know all this sort of stuff and so I guess from my perspective the way that I'm looking at it is well I mean you have that opportunity too if you're, you know, if you are that uh, superstar level player and you think that you can leverage brand value and you think that you have more direct value, like you can end up at one of these other schools or you can go to the NFL. Like these, to me, I guess it just feels like these are options to where, like, if you sign up to play at X school and they don't have this, uh, you know, the direct payment program, or they don't have sort of a, an excessive level, um, you know, endorsement campaign, whatever it is. Like, I, th I think that that is something that's reasonable because it's not like if we did this, that the lower level schools couldn't do NIL. Like we've seen at lower level D1 schools or high level D2 schools, like 
uh, there are athletes who are earning a lot of money through that. And I think that in some ways, because even like the Baker proposal opens the idea to universities being able to sign endorsement deals with their players to endorse the university in a more public way. Like I, I, again, you know, um, now women's basketball has been like the thing that's exploded right now. So that's probably a bad example, like Oklahoma softball, right? Like Oklahoma softball is incredible. They have players who are useful in the community. Uh, you know, and, and I know when you go, uh, I actually, you know, it's funny, you know, we were talking about the city of Boston, right? Like Northwestern hockey has players who are good and notable that would have brand value that Northwestern would want to, or sorry, Northeastern North yeah. <laughs> would, would, would want to keep around. And so like they would still have some ability to do that. They wouldn't just transfer necessarily to the University of Minnesota or whatever, just because of, you know, because of that. I, I think that from my perspective, again, I mean, everything doesn't work as well as it does in theory once it's put into practice regardless, but sort of having this opt-in type system that doesn't sort of declare the entire enterprise to be employees, mm -hmm. because I think that's very complicated. Because again, like like we talked about, I mean, the tracks, you know, the the third string track runner at some school, you know, that probably isn't the same type of employment value and brand value as, you know, a major football player or as, you know, uh, even an average women's basketball player necessarily. But I mean, I, I do think that, uh, that we are in a moment right now in a situation where, you know, ultimately I feel like having that base level of compensation that can be directed from the university. And I, I, I think too, you know, one thing that Nick Saban said as well is that this collective system isn't working because ultimately one, of course, it's so disparate, which, you know, that's a whole other conversation for another day. But the other part of it too is donors are coming to him and being like, do I really have to do this? Like, do I have to keep doing this forever? I have to pay for this, I mean, again, you know, obviously he's not the coach anymore, but like, I have to pay Isaiah Bond's NIL and then he's going to transfer to Texas and play against us? Like, this sucks. This, this is no fun for anybody. And I think that regardless, the money is set to dry up in the current system in a lot of ways because there's been such a rush. And like, uh, you know, I think a great example is like Texas A&M's 2022 recruiting class where you get to throw all this money around and bring in the greatest recruiting class of all time. And now half of them have transferred and the team sucks. And so like, I, I think that this is coming regardless yeah. in a lot of ways, sort of the end of this. But I think having a system that is more built around uh, you know, I, I think actually a good example too, right, is the idea of like how coaching contracts are structured, where there's only X amount that's base compensation that's truly considered university payment, but then technically they signed another contract with the booster club or athletic department that's technically an endorsement contract, right? So Nick Saban's only paid one million to be head coach at Alabama technically, but he's paid ten million dollars as an endorsement contract, like I, I feel like stuff like that is something long-term that might be able to work in some form or fashion. Yeah. I, you've hit on a, a great point on there. And it, it's the, the, the fact is the employment model may be more attractive just for the long-term viability of the system. Um, it's going to be interesting to see where they take it at this point. I think it's inevitable. I think it, I, I'm worried that the NCAA and the, uh, the, the universities if they want to take any action, I'm afraid they're going to end up NILing it again, where no one wanted to take action. And then finally, a court said, hey, guess what? This is now OK. And suddenly we saw the complete chaos of the first years of NIL. Well, they're they're keep putting all their eggs in this basket on let's get Congress to change the law. I hope they're going to take a moment if they plan to take any action. They're going to have to eventually come to terms with the fact that, you know, it's not going to happen. I mean, I don't know. I, I again. He, you have to take into account he's giving the generous version of it. At what point do you take Ted Cruz's like there's a 50-50 chance, subtract the reality amount where it's probably far less than that upper chance that you're going to get legislation in your favor in this congressional cycle. Uh, it's a tick, it's a tick, 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 because what they, they're up against is that ruling. I don't know if it's going to be the Johnson case where suddenly all the players are going to have to be paid over, you know, uh, overtime and, and all the, the players are going to have to be paid the minimum wage. That case is still out there. We're waiting. The, Congress has to act before some of these cases come down because otherwise it's going to be foisted upon us um, whether they like it or not. And, 
you know, again, if you're an athlete, if you're a student athlete, enjoy this moment because I don't know what the future is going to hold for it. Maybe Congress will suddenly come together. I, I'm doubting it, but maybe they will. Maybe we're going to have one of these uh, these decisions come down, which seem quite likely to favor the athletes. We certainly know that if anything goes to the Supreme Court again, Kavanaugh and company definitely are looking forward to to giving the NCAA another shiner. So um, it, it's it's not optimistic. So they have to take action, and maybe that I'm wondering when they're going to call that. And if they because if they do, if they do finally say, "All right, Congress isn't going to work," they are going to absolutely focus hard as nails on that Charlie Baker proposal. But when it first came up, everyone said, "Like, yeah, it's going to be yeah, that isn't something that happens overnight. It'll be a couple of years, maybe." Um, there's the time is not on their side. They have to take action and they have to come up with something now. Um, but yeah, TBD. <laughs> what an exciting <laughs> I will, I, this off season and last off season too. Last off season there were the um, the 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 you know the grumblings of what started to develop this season because I remember I was I was giving some uh, conversation. I was a guest on a show that was focused more on NIL, and every week. It started as kind of like, I'm like, I wonder if we'll have stuff to talk about. Literally, I was like, I wonder if we'll have stuff to talk about. And then suddenly all the states started acting. It was like Missouri passed a law. Florida passed a law. Well, actually, I remember when Mizzou passed a law, everyone was like, holy cow. Um, And I realized at that moment, like, people don't realize what's coming up the pipe. This is going to absolutely destroy any hope of keeping them amateurs if that isn't something you were hoping to do. Um, And now here we are. And it is, it's each year that passes, we are, we are close to the inevitability and their only hope is Congress or creating something that is defensible at a court of law, in which case would be Charlie Baker's proposal. And even then I'm skeptical of how it will do in the, in when challenged. So DVD. Yeah. You know, I, I do think that one thing that should be at least some optimism for this is that it is like, this is like a legitimate hot topic in Congress right now. This is legitimately something that, senators on both sides of the aisle all right i i know because i get every single press release that every one of them sends i've gotten like six emails from tommy tuberville uh, i've gotten like four from uh from cory booker right so like there is a bipartisan consensus i think right now that this needs to change and i mean you think about too the number of senators and congress people really senators especially who came through the NCAA, like John Thune played uh, college basketball at Biola University. Uh, uh, Cory Booker played football at Stanford. A lot of these other, you know, dignitaries and whatever, they played or or supported major college athletic programs. So I, and the other part that you have to mention with it too, is that, you know, the Senate is a, is a funny thing because obviously it's, it gives two senators to every single state, but it means that the places that are most overrepresented are the places that also care about college football the most in a lot of ways. So the the thing that's going to complicate all of this is that this is quite literally an election year, Mm -hmm. a presidential election year. And uh, we've already heard, you know, Ted Cruz yesterday said, I think that we have about two months to get this done because otherwise, once we get to May and June, we're all the way into election season. And he's going to be busy doing whatever it is that Ted Cruz does on a day-to-day basis, recording podcasts and going on Fox, I assume. But I think that uh, that ultimately, two months is a very short timeline to actually get this done with the disparate kind of proposals that are coming through. But uh, I do think that there is, I certainly wouldn't put it at 50-50, but I would have said two years ago, we're at like 2% chance of it getting done. Maybe now I'm at like 15% chance of getting it done. And, you know, in the slowest sense of the word, maybe that's some progress. I think that's about as generous as I could even give it. I give it less than 15%. But yeah, I think that while everyone likes talking about it, it's so unimportant to everybody. And that's the thing. People don't realize this. Congress sounds like it's important. That's what they do. They, they love to talk to their constituents. Oh, yeah, we're having hearings on this. But when a push comes to shove, I mean, just pick up any newspaper, pick whatever. I mean, boy, I'm an old person. Pick up a newspaper, old something, you know, open up any news site and you'll know what topics they're really caring about right now. And I'm going to tell you, uh, I actually remember I was curious, like, oh, I wonder what some of the other takes on this. I was struggling to find any of the regular news sources who were writing about this meeting, um, which kind of indicates about the national interest on the topic, which is a shame, which is a shame. Obviously, we're I'm someone who thinks it's quite important, just like you do. But uh 
Yeah, I'm, I'm skeptical. We'll see if it moves forward. But um, I think this is like, again, the, the indication of all the people showing up for the, the Sabin uh, hearing was just more like it was a it felt more like a fancy photo op than uh, in a lot of ways and what may practically happen. And we'll see. Maybe we'll be wrong. That'll be I, I can't wait if we are. That would be an absolute fascinating. Let's dissect the law that Congress just passed. Um, but uh, TBD. Well, I think that's that might be a good moment to slowly wrap this one up. I just wanted to thank all of you who've been listening. But before we do, any other final thoughts you wanted to throw in on this? No, I, I think ultimately, like you said, that NCAA and college athletics and college football specifically is up against the clock. Uh, one of these things is going to happen. Either a bill is going to get passed in Congress or a court case is going to come down and throw everything uh, out of whack. And while this all happens, I think that there's so much uncertainty and teams and programs are taking advantage. I think that a lot of the biggest issues you see right now in college athletics are because there's nobody there to take control. And now I'm not necessarily saying that the NCAA has to be the entity that takes control because I think that they're a flawed entity in their own ways. But I think that we can all collectively agree there needs to be someone in charge. There needs to be someone in control if this entity and this organization is going to have any chance of moving forward. Because ultimately, we're in a position right now where anytime a rule is passed, everybody's just like, that's not real. Or we're just going to ignore it. We're going to go as far as we can. We saw that with the Tennessee ruling, where now essentially there's no technical rules around NIL and recruiting inducement and all of that. We've seen it around the transfer portal with the West Virginia case. It, like, this is crazy. We can't be creating a major sports system where nobody is allowed to make rules. And that will be the existential question i think as we look forward and whether it is the ncaa whether it is the united states creating a ministry of sports whether it is i i don't know some other third thing somebody needs to be in charge and if we're sitting here in one year on march 13th 2025 and nobody is still in charge i'm going to be incredibly frustrated let's just hand it all to elon musk no i'm sorry just kidding <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness you know I uh, one thing I do want to emphasize as kind of we, we let go is just remember what I said earlier on. And we and I know Shahan's totally in on this, too. The interest in college football is greater than it's ever been. Um, and that's a positive. So I think no matter what happens, you know, I am not a doomsayer on college football. I think it will survive. We're just kind of curious to see how it evolves um, into whatever's next. Uh, on that note, I just wanted to thank all of you again for listening. I wanted to thank our producer, Joey Alliberti. Be sure, if you can, to like, rate, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. You can find us on X and TikTok at CFB Survivor Show. He's Shahan J. Araja. You can find his work at CBSSports.com and at Shahan J. Araja on X and TikTok, as long as TikTok is around. I'm Bob at Kyrie. You can find me as uh, part of our CFB. Take care, everyone. The College Football Survivor Show where playoff survival is always on the line.